Nancy and Dutamik, hello everyone. Welcome to the Indigenous Feminism's Power Panel. Woo. And we know Joan Jett and Hart are playing tonight, so this is a full house. So um, we're going to start today um, with an opening by our knowledge keeper, Paula Howe, who's from Onion Lake. And Paul is going to start us off in um, the right way. Um, she'll be bringing a smudge around, but she's just going to do the four corners of the room. Just because uh, my uh, my grandpa used to uh, teach me when you're gonna speak to the Creator, we don't use the mic because he's gonna hear me anyway, <laughs> no matter what volume I use. So um, the way you pray, the way you think, that's how I'm asking you to help me with this opening uh, prayer. Okay. 
Um, thanks for that, Paula. So uh, my name's Alex Wilson. I'm from the Opaskwayak Cree Nation, which is just down river. <laughs> and I'm really delighted that we have this panel here today. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to say also that um, we're in a really special space. And for those of you who um, were here, you'll remember, and for others, our guests especially, that uh, this is where the first I Don't Know More event happened when the whole movement started. So let's hear it for, for that. <clears throat> so that was uh, November 2012. And so think of all the things that have happened since then. So um, tonight's panel is the Indigenous Feminism's Power Panel. And um, we, we uh, uh, framing it from an Indigenous Feminism's approach we didn't tell the speakers <laughs> what, what to talk about or what to say, um, but they did come up with kind of a theme for the night. And um, so they're gonna be addressing um, how indigenous feminisms can support decolonization basically and through their different perspectives. So we're not here to debate human rights. We're all here from the same framing that, uh, you know, feminism is a, a great way to move forward and so all of these women have done amazing work. So we're going to start um, with Dr. Kim Anderson. Many of you, oh you're going to start? They made me go first. Oh they made you go first, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start with um, Dr. Kim Talbear and many of you have probably um, are familiar with Kim Talbear's work and uh, she's now a professor at the University of um, Alberta. So, <laughs> our rival university, no, no, we support each other. We're on the same river system. <laughs> so Kim is the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belonging, and the False Promise of Genetic Science. That was in 2013. So she's an associate prof in the Faculty of uh, Native Studies at U of A, as I said. She studies the racial politics of gene talk in science and pop culture. And she's also interested in the similarities between Western constructions of nature and sexuality and how they can be understood differently in Indigenous worldviews. She draws on Indigenous feminist and queer theory in her teaching and research um, that focus on under, undermining the nature cultural spit, split and its role in colonialism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and environmental degradation. Talbear blogs at Indigeneity and Technoscience, and her um, website is kimtalbear.com. She's a citizen of the Sisseton, Wapaton, Oyate, and South Dakota, and is also descended from the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes or nations of Oklahoma. So um, please, um, should I introduce all of you first, or? Okay, we'll do, th we'll do them all at once. Okay, and um, who's going next then? Okay, Kim. So as I said earlier, many of you are probably familiar with uh, Dr. Kim Anderson. She's from this territory. Uh, she spent most of her career researching and writing about the health and well-being of Indigenous families in Canada. Her books include A Recognition of Being, Reconstructing Native Womanhood, and Life Stages and Native Women, Memory Teachings, and Story Medicine. She recently co-edited a volume with um, Rob Innes entitled Indigenous Men, Masculinities, Legacies, Identities, and Regeneration. She teaches at Wilfrid Laurier University in Brantford, Ontario. And if you didn't notice when you came in, on the left side there, there's um, Turning the Tides has all of their books for sale. So if, if you want to stop and pick up a book, there'll be time after for you to um, meet these incredible women and maybe get a, an autograph or two. Um, so our third and final panelist, the anchor of the panel as you call her, is uh, Dr. Audra Simpson. And some of you I see familiar faces from earlier this afternoon where she delivered a, an amazing, amazing um, uh, lecture uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. And both of these lectures actually will be recorded. They're being recorded, so you can look at the link later and watch it over and over and over again. Share with your friends. <laughs> so Audra is an associate professor of anthropology at Columbia University. She's the author of Mohawk Interruptus, Political Life Across the Borders of Settler States. That was published by Duke University Press. And she's the co-editor 
of theorizing Native studies. Um, she has articles in cultural anthropology, American Quarterly, Junctures, uh, Law, and Contemporary Problems in, um, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, Wicazo? Review? Wachazo Sa Review. And in 2010, she won Columbia University's School for General Studies Excellence in Teaching Award. And she's a Mohawk from Kahnawake. So let's give a round of applause for our <laughs> guests. And we'll start with Dr. Talbert. Okay. If, we, if it's not, it's not a big deal. I won't use them. Okay. Well, I'll try. Okay. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. We really appreciate having, ooh, having a nice audience. No, if it won't work, no problem. I'll just, they're dim. I had some pretty pictures from another PowerPoint that might help sort of situate what I'm talking about, but they'll be a little um, hard to see. So we were tasked with talking about the role of uh, indigenous feminisms in decolonization, but I don't actually use the, use the word decolonization very much. I use it very sparingly, and I'm very particular about what I mean when I say that. And I often use it for shorthand um, when it's just the easiest thing to say, right? Sometimes we just reach for the easiest word on the shelf because it would be too much to explain to people the complex thing we're thinking. We all do that. Everybody does theory, not just academics. People in community do theory too, right? You, you have a framework for how you think about the world and, and that you use to analyze the world. So, And sometimes the way that you're thinking is just too complex. So decolonization might, might fill that. So. What I think of instead of decolonization is I think about being in good relation. And, but the, the problem is, is that to people who speak English, being in, being in relation or in good relation sounds really vague and facile, right? Um, and those of you who come from cultures where you talk a lot about being in good relation, you know what a complex thing that is. And I think about being in good relation with other human beings. And I think about being in good relation with my non-human relatives. Um, I will get to feminism. So feminism is another word that sort of stands in for me um, for that idea of being in good relation. And so when I approach feminism, it's not really always women necessarily that I'm thinking or talking about, although women are, of course, humans in relationship to other humans and non-humans, and so that, that factors in. So being in good relation, and the second thing I think about is dismantling hierarchies. And my desire to dismantle hierarchies in science, and so there are some pictures up there, although they're hard to see, um, is actually what brought me to feminism. And this is just, these are the ways in which I think about the role of indigenous peoples in science. And this is the center of the work that I do. And I do this through an indigenous and feminist lens. The first thing is that indigenous peoples are usually viewed as the objects of research. And you probably can't see it very well, but that's a Tibetan woman in 1939 having her head measured through cranio craniometric apparatuses by a guy who was a physical anthropologist who later became a Nazi scientist. Um, and the Nazis learned eugenics and physical anthropology from the Americans, from the American School of Physical Anthropology. One of the main research centers of that was at Harvard University. So um, that, it, while she's Tibetan, I, this is the, one of the things we need to think about, right? This has traditionally been the role of indigenous peoples in science, that our bodies, like our lands, were the raw materials for the development of the nation. And science is one way in which uh, settler states develop the nation. And they do it upon our bodies as well as our lands. The second role in which that indigenous peoples have in science is as collaborators in science. And that's a greenhouse that some tribal members in California co-designed with some Berkeley engineers and architects. The third picture is Nani Bagarison, who's a Diné or Navajo scientist. She's a geneticist. I think indigenous people should become scientists. And the fourth one is uh, an example of tribes governing through science in a bad way. That's a DNA testing card. <laughs> and a lot of tribes in the US use DNA testing now. So when I started doing all of this work, I came to uh, feminism because it helped me analyze the politics of science and technology and their role in the colonial project. So, but before I get to that, I wanna just talk about the second thing of dismantling hierarchy. So when I said my feminism is about more than women, the fundamental hierarchy that I look at in all of my work and that I try, try to pay attention to is this notion of there being civilized peoples versus savage peoples. And we all know where we stood and our ancestors stood on that, the side of that binary, right? So for me, that's the sort of fundamental divide that people get divided into in a Eurocentric framework. Civilized versus savage. 
nature versus culture. Those who have culture are more civilized. Those who have less culture are viewed as part of nature, and indigenous peoples have been viewed as part of nature. Men versus women. Men have been viewed historically in a Eurocentric framework as more rational, women closer to nature. Uh, white people versus the rest of the people, straight people versus queer, uh, able-bodied versus disabled, human versus animal, all of those hierarchies and binaries really rest upon the fundamental one, which is who is more civilized versus who is more who or what is more savage. And so it's those two things that I look at in all of my work. I want to dismantle hierarchies and I want to think about how we can be in better relation with uh, our human relatives and the non-human world. So how did I get to be an indigenous feminist? So I'm gonna walk over here and switch to the next slide because I have more pictures that might help me just, yeah, well, thanks Kim. So I was having a conversation at another indigenous feminism panel last week in Alberta um, with Dori Nason and Dori Nason teaches in the, uh, what is it, First Nations and Indigenous Studies program at the uh, University of British Columbia. And Dori was recounting her journey to indigenous feminism. And so I'm gonna talk about, I hope she wouldn't mind both, both her and I, because it struck me that um, she might have what is considered a more mainstream path to indigenous feminism in the academy. And that was definitely not my path. So Dori and I both went to graduate school in California. Um, she was at Berkeley for part of the time and I was at um, the University of California, Santa Cruz, and this is in the early 2000s. And this is a time in which there, it, there was a lot of, uh, intense conversation and activism and scholarship happening around women of color feminisms and indigenous feminisms. I stayed a mile away from that. Now, I grew up in South Dakota. Um, mostly, I also lived in the Twin Cities when I was in high school. And while all of the, the women run my family and they run my community and we, we, we all act like a bunch of feminists, but this is not a word that a lot of us were very comfortable with. So I came to California with that kind of rural South Dakota attitude. Um, and what I saw was a lot of uh, people, women who called themselves women of color, organizing research clusters and conferences and events and really doing a lot of organizing as women of color. And I didn't have the language back then 15 years ago about why that term didn't resonate with me, but I've since figured it out. There were a few things going on in California at that time. What you have to understand about the, the, the University of California system is there actually weren't a lot of California native people in that system. What you had was diasporic people, so people who were coming from other places. Um, there, there was a lot of relocation, um, and we had uh, mid 20th century relocation policies, you may, maybe you had them here, I don't know, where native people were transported from reservations to cities as, a, as a, an assimilation project, right? And so what you had was in LA and San Francisco and Oakland, um, a lot of native people who had come from say Oklahoma, South Dakota, uh, you know, Minnesota, and they'd come out to California. And so you had people living in diaspora. So multiple generations of native people living out there who from my reservation based perspective, had, they hadn't been home in a while and were not terribly tied to those land bases. And so for me, all of the projects that I work on and the struggles that I think about are all tied to human land relations. That's my particular bias. And so that's not what was happening in California. You had people who were, who were out there for multiple generations away from their ancestral land bases. And what was happening is they were identifying as indigenous or Native American, but that became like a racial category, one among several racial categories under the broader umbrella of the United States. And so you had, you know, you had white women, you had Asian American women or, or Pacific Islanders, you had African American or black women, you had indigenous or Native American women. And that never made sense to me because I have no desire to identify even though I recognize that race conditions the possibilities for indigenous governance and, and, and how we are viewed, I don't deny that at all because I study race, but it didn't make sense to me personally to identify as a woman of color. I view myself as a Dakota woman, I view myself uh, in the old terminology as an American Indian woman, then I became a Native American in the 80s because that became politically correct, and then I became indigenous in the 90s when I found out what that meant, <laughs> and I started traveling internationally. But, Woman of color, what that did to me was it, it, it said it's lumping us all together into this group under this umbrella that's really defining us in relationship to the white man. And I just don't have an interest in identifying that way. I recognize that, that a lot of that woman of color feminism did some really important work, really important intellectual work. 
But as I said, I kind of stayed away from that. And the other thing is the indigenous politics happening around indigenous feminisms in California in the, in the early 2000s just didn't resonate with me. And I stayed very, very far away from that. A lot of it to me seemed to, to um, coalesce around these problems of identity. And I personally am not that interested, even though I wrote a book on DNA testing, that book is sort of critiquing and gazing and looking back at scientists who are so intent at looking at us. So I'm, re I'm turning the gaze back in that book. But I'm, my project is not really to be researching and looking at identity all the time. I'm really concerned more with land-based struggles, with building institutions, with doing environmental work, with deconstructing white people's weird sexuality and senses of relationships that they've imposed upon us in the colonial project. I'm really interested in looking at them and what their problems are because they make problems for us. So a lot of what was happening in indigenous feminisms in California, it seemed to me, was was this stuff that was really focused on identity and who's indigenous and who's not. I, you know, I, I just don't have a lot of time for that. So what, ha what so, and I actually wrote an article in 2006, um, Cecilia Firethunder was the first woman elected as a tribal chairperson of the Oglala Lakota uh, Nation the, at Pine Ridge. And in 2006, the state of South Dakota tried to pass an abortion ban statewide. They're so stupid, they forget that tribes go by federal law. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what they do, the, the res reservations go by federal law, so they could pass an abortion ban. Cecilia Firethunder had come home from California. She was a nurse practitioner, got elected as tribal chairperson amidst a tremendous amount of sexism at Pine Ridge, and said, we're starting a healthy choices clinic. And this clinic isn't just gonna provide abortions or pregnancy terminations, but it's going to provide all kinds of counseling, um, it's gonna provide programs for new parents, both men and women, young men and women. Um, to, so it was a very kind of comprehensive uh, uh, physical and mental health kind of facility she was planning. And what happened was this really hit the press in 2006 and you had both pro-life advocates and pro-choice advocates in the United States, largely non-native, who jumped on this topic. And I wrote an article about this in which I said, and I'm telling you about this because I said I am not a feminist. So in 2006, I was very clear that I was not a feminist, but I was very much in support of what Cecilia was doing because I was in support of these Lakota women who were under incredible stress, um, who had to make choices about whether to have babies or not have babies in the middle of a severely compromised environment, right? There's a lot of poverty. There's, there's a lot of racism there. There's a, there's a lot of... Um, uh, sexual violence, and and Cecilia was really approaching this not from these purest positions of it's either pro-life all the way or pro-choice all the way, but she was really focused on the collective, and and Lakota people making the kinds of decisions about reproduction that they needed to make in a, a very kind of tense and difficult environment, and she was interested in supporting Lakota women and men in this, and and it's these are largely very young women and and young men. And so, um, going back to 2006, I'm not a feminist, so, so how did I get to be a feminist? Can we go to the next one, and then that's the last one, Kim. <clears throat> so these are just some pictures from old school, let's see. Vine Deloria Jr., I understand you have books that are similar up here, so uh, Vine Deloria Jr. wrote Custer Died for Your Sins, I think that was published in 69. Um, groundbreaking book. You've got a group of American Indian Studies scholars in the top. You've got a picture of the survival, one of the survival school, um, Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul, the survival school movement. You've got, I don't like to always show these masculinist photo op native guys. That's Russell Means and Dennis Banks down in the bottom left hand corner as being the face of the American Indian movement. This is actually a critical slide I have. What I was trying to show in this slide was that there was a whole lot going on behind the scenes of the American Indian movement. That's my mom in the center. And my mom, that's her high school graduation picture, was the main grant writer for Red Schoolhouse. Um, and so what you had in that moment was Vine Deloria Jr. writing that book. My mom was an undergrad at Northern State College in Aberdeen, South Dakota. So I remember being four or five years old. I couldn't read yet. It was before kindergarten. And I remember saying to my mom, what does that mean, Custer died for your sins? I knew who George Custer was, George Armstrong Custer was, but I didn't even understand what Jesus died for your sins meant yet. And so it was very perplexing to me, but that's how influential he was. And so the American Indian movement was really in intensely happening in Aberdeen at that time. There was a student group there. And um, one of the things my mom had raised us, she had four children by the time she was 24 and she's an undergrad. <laughs> and uh, she raised us with a, a, a lot of knowledge of Dakota oral history. And she told me very early on that uh, while 
and, and Deloria does this as well. So my mom and Vine Deloria Jr. were the two main theorists in my early life. They're the two main intellectual influences and I cite them as foundational thinkers in all of my work. She and he both taught me at a very young age that we need to tell our own stories from out of our own lives. So the South Dakota public schools were incredibly racist and the history was whitewashed. And I would come home and I would get schooled in more accurate history from my mom, not only from books that she had in the house, but from oral histories from, from Dakota people. And so this is how I got to feminism. Fast forward to 2000, 2001, and I encounter feminist epistemologies, I encounter feminist science studies, so feminist thinkers who are critiquing the role of science in the colonial project, and they, they were talking about things like standpoint and feminist objectivity. And feminist objectivity is really easy, or it was easy for me to understand because my mom and Vine Deloria had already taught me this, that you see more clearly when you're coming from a marginalized perspective, because you don't only see the world through your eyes, but you have to see the world through the white man's eyes, right? Because you have to know how the world works through his eyes and you have to know how the world works through your eyes. He only sees his world, and, and because he's not marginalized, he doesn't have to see your point of view. And the other thing is that, that they both taught me was that if we get these sort of multiple marginalized perspectives together, we have a more rigorous view of how the world really is. And so feminist objectivity does not allow objectivity in science, for example, to be conflated with neutrality. Nobody gets to be neutral, nobody gets to stand nowhere and be unbiased. We are all standing, at the forefront of a long history of cultural processes and politics, right? And, and, and I understood that I, when I got the theoretical language in graduate school. It's not the language that my mom used, it's not the language Vine Deloria used, but when I got to grad school and encountered feminist objectivity, that made sense to me. So what happened there? I saw feminists had developed an academic theoretical language for critiquing the role of science in the colonial project. And what I saw coming out of Native Studies was that we had we in Native Studies had not done such a good job of that. We tended to focus on the law more and culture. And in the United States, we focus a lot on literature and history. In my mind, the front edge of defending indigenous sovereignty is engaging with science and technology. That is, it is just at the center of how our lives are being shaped and controlled by the colonial state. And so I saw that feminists and queer theorists and crip theorists or disability studies scholars had also done a really good job of theorizing how their bodies were exploited by scientists in, 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 the, in the building of uh, settler colonial visions of what is normal and, and how things should be. And so I started hanging out with them. I thought, no, indigenous thinkers need to be at the table with feminists, we need to be at the table with disability studies scholars, and we need to be at the table with queer theorists because we're making very similar kinds of critiques of power. So that's how I became a feminist. It wasn't because of indigenous women, it was because of a lot of white women actually and queer people who were doing, who were making these same kinds of critiques of science and technology. So I guess I just wanna say that I don't, I don't think there's only one road to indigenous feminism, and I actually think that that woman of color feminism that was happening in California and then the indigenous feminists that were organizing with them I view personally that more as the mainstream of indigenous feminism and, it, and it is, it's not where I come from, although now I find myself coming back and, and hooking up with people like that and I'm grateful for the work that they do but it's, it's definitely not how I got there. And there's just a couple of closing things I wanna say. Coming back to that idea that I don't identify as a woman of color, even though it is legitimate for others to identify me that way if the, in, in terms of trying to understand where I stand in a particular society or in relationship to a particular political project. I, when I learned that the Black Lives Matter movement was actually started by queer black women, and then I started to really pay attention to the way that they were organizing. So if you remember at the University of Missouri, when, the, when all of the, many of the young black men refused to play football, when was that this last summer or last spring? They refused to play football because there were some pretty egregious incidents of, of inst structural racism at the University of Missouri and they actually got the president to resign because football is big money. You don't not play football, right? <laughs> and so it was interesting to watch those young men use the power that they had. And then, and then uh, some of the, the white football players also allied with them and the coaches. And that got a lot of press, and that's really great that, that young, those young men did that and used their power as athletes in that way. But the real organizers behind the scenes who had started that movement were queer black women. And that reminded me a little bit of Idle No More, which was also organized by women. And, and then I go back to Kim Anderson's work, actually. 
and the way that you talk about um, women, feminism being important and women caretaking community as part of caretaking the people. And I thought, th this, is, this is what I see Idle No More doing and this is what I see Black Lives Matter doing. I see black queer women caretaking their people. Now that's my indigenous standpoint. They may not view it that way. And I'm in the process of writing chapters in a book with a with an uh, African-American scholar who's actually writing on Black Lives Matter, so we'll see what she says about this. But I am really interested in speaking and relating to those women like people to people. I don't want to say we're all women of color under this umbrella, because what that does is it centers the white power structure, and I'm not interested in that. I come from a people that have a long history in the Americas, and I want to relate to those women as a people. I realize that's complicated and I'm at the beginning of my thinking about that, but that is that really makes a lot more sense to me than, than sort of forwarding any kind of category that centers white power. I don't wanna do that. I wanna, I wanna sort of center our relationships with one another. And if you think, for example, coming back to the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, if you looked at those calls to action, there's only two little bullet points under the newcomer, newcomers header. So when they're thinking about new immigrants, those bullet points are really interesting. They're, they're, a, they're barely a start. The first one is that Aboriginal history should be included in the, the histories that are taught to new immigrants that they have to learn to become citizens. And the second one is that they want to add some language about um, indigenous people into the oath of citizenship. What that is telling newcomers is that, oh, you need to recognize those indigenous people like we do. It's still cent centering the settler state. And I am much more interested in indigenous peoples ourselves developing those relationships with other people. So for example, I worked many years ago, I was meeting with uh, some land trust people in Vancouver and they were working with a, uh, an indigenous, uh, with a first nation in Vancouver and I can never pronounce their names, so I'm not gonna try to because <laughs> they have lots of X's in their words. But what was really interesting to me was they had started an ecotourism project where they were working with, um, I think, new Chinese immigrants because it was the Chinese immigrants that were actually going out and gathering some of their uh, traditional resources and they were not okay with that because it was impinging on their traditional life ways. And so it wasn't whites that had an interest in that. It was, it was new Asian immigrants. And so they were trying to figure out ways to develop their own relationships with those new immigrants. And I think we need to think about doing that and not always going through the settler state, right? They're there, but, but we have to, to the degree that we can, not always be focused on them and centering our own relations. So then I'll just close with one other thought. <clears throat> Because I, I have never, because the word feminist to me stands in for being in good relation. It stands in for dismantling hierarchies. I wonder if there are better words, and I have a student at the University of Alberta who is very uncomfortable with the word feminism, yet she recognizes when she looks at definitions of it, she's Cree, that she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm a feminist. And one of the things we're talking about is I would like to see us dig into our languages or our ancestors or our parents' or grandparents' languages, and she's doing this with Cree, and try to find words or concepts that embody the kinds of relations that we want to be in and start theorizing from out of our indigenous languages. And again, we'll have to translate that into English. Right, But those translation projects, as imperfect as they are and as incomplete as they are, they're really interesting. And so I'm really kind of pushing her to, to think about if she doesn't like the word feminism, what, what, kind of, what kind of ethic is she trying to advocate in terms of her relationships um, that feminism is standing in for in English? And is there some kind of word or concept she can pull out of Cree and theorize through that? And I said to her, if you come up with something, then maybe I'll just be a post-feminist with you, you know, or maybe I'll do that in, in Dakota language as well. So um, I think I'll stop there. Those are my thoughts on indigenous feminism. <laughs> Hello, oh, I'm gonna do the Joan Jett. In honor of Joan Jett, I'm gonna wander around and see if I can do this with my, between my glasses, the microphone, the, uh, the slideshow, it's a bit challenging in my notes. Starting to feel like a crazy old lady prof, but I guess uh, that's good, right? Um, so I just wanna say first of all how, uh, 
how happy I am to be in Saskatoon. I've spent a lot of time here. Um, my people are from Manitoba, actually, but this is all, it's all, you know, whatever. It's same, 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 uh, well, Métis people from all across the, the country, actually, so. Um, but I really do feel at home here, and I'm just so happy. Thank you all for coming. This is awesome. So, um, yeah, I just want to um, acknowledge being in Métis homelands and, uh, and the Treaty 6 um, territories. So um, what I think what I'll talk about is similar to, the, to what Kim was doing, was talking about how do I come to this label of being Indigenous feminists. Uh, we were all, I guess we were all outed as Indigenous feminists as being on this panel. And um, so I thought I'd talk about growing my Indigenous feminist theory and practice. How did I come around to it? And I recognize that people, those of you at the back probably can't see this very well, right? Am I right? Can't see anything? So I'll just have to read a little bit and... It's more for me to be, be able to keep on track so I don't get to, so I don't spin off into other directions. But I think the first thing um, about feminism or indigenous feminism is, you know, everybody's like really scared of this word, right? And resisting the, the F word. And so, um, you know, this is when, when I talk about it with my students and when I do stuff in community, I say, well, why is it that feminism itself as a word, not just indigenous feminism, but feminism is so hard for people to accept, right? And um, so these are my little theories on it around in the mainstream, how it's, it's hard to acknowledge a widespread oppression that affects everybody, right? Maybe people have a hard time accepting that about how it's so ubiquitous. And um, those things are hard to acknowledge, perhaps. Um, it's been uh, given a really bad rap in the media and in popular discourse and discussion, right? You know, that there's all these kind of myths about feminism and the, you know, the bra burners or whatever people say, um, which doesn't really have much to do with what feminism is, but it's been given that kind of negative uh, slam to it. And um, patriarchy is, of course, deeply entrenched in our societies. Uh, so there's this fear around challenging um, and, and, th and that change. Um, and then I have others, but I won't make you guys work like, like I do for my students. And so then you have feminism in Indian country. Why is it that in Indian country, again, it's the F word, and then why is it that we've been so long to come around to this, this, um, this um, word, indigenous feminism? And um, if you look at... Um, uh, black feminism and also indigenous feminism. There's, and you, you know, I started reading around, seeing why people were resisting and what people say. Sometimes we're afraid of uh, airing our dirty laundry in public. We don't want to talk about uh, male dominance, uh, violence. We don't want to talk about how patriarchy is working in our communities because, you know, that will kind of impinge on us collectively having a voice, right? Um, so sovereignty, and this is like, you'll forgive me, I'm, a little, I'm going a little bit back in history here um, because now it's not such a dirty word, but sovereignty and those issues, people say, will kind of trump um, the issues of, of women's issues, right? So if we can work towards sovereignty, then we don't, you know, it'll kind of solve, automatically solve uh, all those problems around gender discrimination. Some people will say it's a white woman's issue. Um, as a way of dis discouraging it. It's an attack on our traditional roles, and in particular, mothering and motherhood, um, seen as wanting the, quote, sameness of men. So uh, well, we don't want to be the same as men, so we're not feminists. And um, it's about, you know, uh, white feminism is like about rights versus what we talk about in terms of responsibilities. So, um, you know, when I... When I um, when I went back to school, when I did uh, grad school, when I was in my 30s, I, I went back and I did a master's. And I, had, I was doing all this stuff around in, uh, women, and I had never actually read any feminist literature. I started reading it and, and learning a bit about it. And then um, doing work around women's, women's, um, women's issues, uh, the sacredness of women, thinking about women's bodies. I got kind of launched into it because when I got pregnant, for the first time when I was uh, 31, it really blew me away. And I, I, I started to think about how incredibly uh, sacred that was and how powerful and how scary it was to be responsible for somebody else's life and um, my body and what my body was doing. You know, it just, I mean, it sounds kind of trite and, you know, whatever, cliche or whatever, but it really blew me away. So I started doing work around um, women and women's issues and women's bodies and so on. 
And years later, uh, this is a book that was published in 2010. I think there was a conference at University of Alberta in 2006 on Indigenous feminism. And um, then years later, Cheryl Suzak, who edited this book, she says, well, I want you to write a chapter in this book about how you became an Indigenous feminist. I said, oh, I didn't know I was an Indigenous feminist. I uh, never really thought of it that way, I guess. But so because of the work I'd been doing in terms of talking about um, women and how do we reclaim the sacredness of our bodies and our lives, and um, people started calling me an Indigenous feminist. So she asked me to write this chapter, and I said, oh, geez, now I have to think about how did I, how did I come to this position? And so I went back and I thought um, not just about the pregnancy and mothering and motherhood and how that launched me into trying to think about how do we um, honor, recognize, respect, give authorities to, to mothers and women in our communities. Uh, but I was also thinking about, you know, back in, the, back in the day when I worked for the chiefs. I worked for the chiefs of Ontario for a while. And um, when I was there, I used to feel kind of, you know, I thought, I, I think I'm seeing something like a fault line going on here because I would go out to communities to do community consultation and what I saw in the communities, and of course I was doing lots of social, uh, social stuff, planning around child welfare, child care, all these things. I saw all these women doing all this organizing and so on, um, but we were trying to talk about those issues in terms of self-governance and, and a lot of the time I would hear, oh, you know, that we don't know nothing about, that's, that's not our business, you know, that's for the chiefs and the political leaders. And I thought, well, then I'd go to the, the assemblies and I'd see all these mostly male chiefs get up and talk about their community and I wasn't seeing what was going on at the, at the community level and it was a gendered fault line that was going on, right? Um, and so I started to think about how, um, you know, men got power in our governing um, institutions. What does that mean? What does it mean in terms of where we're going as peoples? And... Um, when I, when I was writing this article for, for Cheryl's book, I was, um, I was trying to make a case for saying, okay, you know what, I understand why there's this resistance to feminism and why we say, well, it doesn't have nothing to do with us or whatever, but I said, you know, we gotta actually read the feminist literature and there's a whole lot of it and it comes from all sorts of different areas and the one that I was interested in was thinking about um, the feminist literature that speaks to uh, how nationalist movements are built with male dominance, how the traditional woman or the um, regulation of women, control of women is really part of nationalism and fundamentalist movements. And if you start to look at that in other contexts around the world, you can pull out those things that allow you to analyze what actually goes on in our communities and in our, uh, our institutions, our political institutions. Not everywhere, not all the time, but it allows us to have an analysis of that. So um, that was my little indigenous feminist outing and, uh, and also encouraging people to say, we can draw from all sorts of different types of feminist literature and practice to be able to think very deeply about what's going on in our communities, right? And how does it apply in our communities? So the other thing, um, the other thing that I did when I first had to start talking about feminism, I said, well, I'll go and look it up in the dictionary, find out what feminism is, right? So I look it up in my, uh, my, my little Merriam-Webster, and it says, well, feminism is the theory of political, economic, and social equality for the sexes. Well, what's wrong with that, right? Is there something, is there something you know, really scary and problematic about that? And then, in the course of doing research for um, A Recognition of Being, which was my first authored book that I published in 2000, I thought, okay, I'm gonna go back and look at um, these systems of gender in our communities. And lo and behold, when you look at our communities, and I'm being a little pan-Indian here, but when you look at indigenous societies in Turtle Island, it's like, well, that's what we had, right? We, we, were, we were, if you wanna go by that definition, we were feminist societies. We had political, economic, and social equality among the sexes. How and why? Politically, um, you know, our governing, our governing institutions prior to the imposition of Indian Act uh, recognized women's authorities and they in fact had places for women to be able to have political voice and, and governance, right? And so we had, you know, hereditary women chiefs, we had clan mothers, women's councils, advisors, all sorts of ways in which women exercise political authority. We had uh, socially, 
you know, it doesn't get much more um, powerful than, than grandma, right? Women manage kin networks, and we were kin-based societies. Our, everything had to do with uh, kinship, right? Your economy, your governing systems, all of that. And women were the ones in charge of those kin-based societies. So socially, there was, a lot of, um, there was a lot of authority there, right? But always in balance with what was going on with the men as well. And then economically, if women were uh, in charge of resources that came into the community, in charge of distributing resources, storing resources like corn, uh, that's your bank, right? They're the bankers, they're the wealth of the nation, and they're the ones who are in charge of making sure those resources are distributed. So that's an economic authority. And then, of course, spiritually, we had and still have, of course, um, women who were, um, um, you know, doctors and ceremonialists and so on, right? Leaders, spiritual leaders. So, you know, when I think about the colonization of Native womanhood and how we became uh, defeminist societies, how we were uh, defeminized, of course, politically, we put in the Indian Act and we en end up where, you know, only men can be chiefs, only men can be elected to council, and of course, all of those rules about sort of excluding women from that system into the 1950s. Um, Socially, there's this whole campaign to break down our extended families, which gave uh, you know, a position for everybody within those families, and to impose male-headed nuclear families, which gave men a lot of power over those small units that they were trying to create. Now, of course, we know this didn't actually work all the way, right? But this was the project, and some of it did take a hold, right? So we have to think about where and how, and, and what's still going on of the, of the good stuff that we had going on. Um, and how, you know, how, how is it playing out today? Um, economically, women's traditional skills and labor gets devalued when you bring in a capitalist economy and you have wage labor introduced and who's making the money. Um, and then spiritually, um, the systems that were introduced were negating the, the female-centered uh, female creation stories we had and female leadership, right? If you, if you look at, um, um, at the time when um, Christian systems were introduced to us. So these are things that I, um, that I was thinking about and um, writing about when I first published A Recognition of Being in 2000. And uh, I've had to sort of look at this and rethink about it now because they asked me to do a revised edition, which kind of terrified me because I thought, oh my god, now I have to go back and read something I wrote like 15 years ago. And did I make any sense? And <laughs> was it total, you know, did I just romanticize everything? And was I, you know, did I actually know what I was talking about? And of course, I've done lots more reading and thinking about it since. Um, so I, this, this book was um, originally, you know, I, lo I looked at those, I looked at how our, our womanhood got colonized. I looked at those historical processes. And then I interviewed all these magnificent Native women I knew across the country, and I kind of traced um, their path to a really positive identity um, through the things that they had done and looking at how a lot of these authorities are still existent and how do we reclaim them and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, I had to go back and, uh, and look at, I had to read the book again, which my, actually my PhD supervisor made me do. He made me read it and review it. And I said, oh my God. So I, I had to read it and I had to go through it really thoroughly. And when I read it, I thought, okay, well, not bad, actually, because a lot of the material in the book is based on stories of women that I had interviewed. And those stories are as powerful as they were 16 years ago, right? They're still there. Um, they also tell of a history of reclamation of women looking to, to um, find their authorities, to find their magnificence, in spite of all the, the, the sexism and the patriarchy and all these systems that were introduced that I just, that I just named off very quickly, right? And... Um, so I had to look at that, but I also had to you know, be all scholarly and look at all the literature that had been produced since, uh, since that time, since 2000 when I, when I published it, which was also a very daunting process, right? Because you know, when you're doing scholarly work, you think you have to get every single thing that's ever been written in there and weave it all together and all this. And so I kept ordering more books from the library, piling them up and not getting through them and trying to read them. But the good news is that there was so much literature that had been produced that might be called indigenous feminist literature since you know, the last 15 years, right? There's so much that's been produced because when I was first writing this, there wasn't a whole lot. And I had to kind of 
steal and borrow from things and get a little broader than I might have needed to. And so I first recognized that um, there, there's been a real uptake on this and things have changed quite quickly, right? Um, so we can talk maybe more about the feminist literature, but I think one, two things that have changed in more, even in more recent years and literature is uh, queer theory and queer literature, queer indigenous studies, and um, the one that I'm flogging tomorrow night, which is indigenous men and masculinities uh, studies or indigenous masculinity studies. So um, let me see where I'm going. Tell me if I have to stop talking because... Um, okay, so... In terms, of, um, in terms of queer theory, Kim's talked about it a little bit, I think that um, there's, there's so much more room for doing more oral history in this area. Um, and it, it allows us to start looking at not just patriarchy, which was the language I was using uh, years ago when I did this, but now heteropatriarchy, right? Heterosexism, heteronormativity. It allows us to start looking at those elements and be more nuanced and trying to figure out, you know, what happened to us? How did we become defeminized? Um, and 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 how does how does queer theory help us to start to think through that? And I see things changing um, a lot in terms of um, kinship, right? And how we begin to understand kinship and the positioning of two-spirited people in theory in understanding that better. And I see it a lot coming from youth, uh, which is fantastic, who are challenging some of these notions and even some of, the, some of the things that I've been teaching for years about women's roles and so on and the body. I get questions about that, about people trying to kind of unpack what does that mean um, in terms of uh, trans people, in terms of two-spirited people, how do we um, open it up and, and uh, make more space for understanding um, two-spirited people and trans people in our societies. Um, and maybe we can have some discussion about that, about the, the, the good um, places where it's going with that. And masculinities, this is uh, my shameless plug, flogging of our book, which has come out in, uh, in uh, November, came out in November, Indigenous Men and Masculinities, Legacies, Identities, and Regeneration, which is with their very own Robert Innes, who's here, um, and I. And um, this, too, is allowing us to start to think about um, from an indigenous feminist perspective, what happened to the men as a result of that process of breaking down the equality between the sexes that I've described here? What happened to the men in terms of uh, being stripped of some of their uh, authorities and the sacredness of them and their roles and responsibilities and all those types of things and handed just this, um, this dominance and violence, which was the only kind of authority that they were given by settler society, right? What happened? So we're exploring some of those, um, some of those, I some of those ideas, and starting to sort of um, not only look at at what happened, but what are the possibilities, right, in terms of where we're going uh, around being healthy. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna run running on a little bit. I thought I'd just end with my picture of my giant attack of the 50 foot squaw poster that I found on the internet one time, and say. This is maybe, um, well, maybe this is a good introduction to Audra. No. <laughs> Thank you for listening. That was both awful and beautiful. <laughs> I'm so flattered. <laughs> um, so I want to um, echo my gratitude to the um, organizers of this event, to all of you for coming here. I didn't realize we were in a politically sacred space and I'm uh, just so delighted to be in the first site of Idle No More Conversations. Um, as well, I, I missed out on acknowledging Métis um, ownership or caretaking of this territory earlier in the day. So I do not want to have to deal with exploding sashes and Métis rage. <laughs> I acknowledge and thank the Métis for allowing me to pass through this territory along with Treaty 6 peoples. So 
Um, my understanding was this was an informal conversation, so I am most informal in my approach to this, and you'll have to forgive me because I gave a, a long lecture earlier today. But I have many thoughts on this, and I'm prompted, of course, by the question that Alex Wilson posed to us, which is, what is the role of indigenous feminism in decolonization? So I'll organize my thoughts according to that question. Oh, no, please. <laughs> Really? You're not really the 50-footer then. Oh, man, I'm the five-foot-sixer. <laughs> Choking on my Spanx and trying to keep it together. <laughs> I'm so tired. So, you know. I'm like, really? Seriously? You want to sit and be supportive? No, I don't. I want to sit and be quiet. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So... So Alex invited us to think of our comments, not PowerPoints, lady, women. I mean, I am the PowerPoint right now. Um, I'm, um, I'm a, so I organize our comments according to this question, what is the role of indigenous feminism in decolonization? And indeed, like um, Kim Talbear, decolonization strangely perhaps, or not strangely, I wonder how this is for other indigenous folks here, other allies, other activists. Decolonization is not a part of my daily thought process, right? It is a space of aspiration perhaps for my politics, my aspiration, my day-to-day -day life, but I see de decolonization as a kind of thing that is to be dreamed for, to be hoped for, but I'm not optimistic. <laughs> and part of the reason why I'm not optimistic is because it involves the return of land. So I have a, in my thinking, it is the return of land, it is um, the complete recalibration of the way we think about ourselves and about others, and I think it's, it's a reinstantiation of our governance systems and our philosophical systems that guide those governance systems. So feminism for me is a serious part of that process, but like decolonization, I don't think feminism is a part of everyday life. I don't think it's a part of our thought processes. I do think that we are somewhat colonized, right? But I don't think it's something that is absolute. I don't think it's forever. And I'm optimistic that we are in a process through feminist practice, right? And this, some of this is comes from more traditional white feminism or woman of color feminism, and also our own philosophical practices, which are inherently attentive to land, to water, to gender orders, we are starting to move things a bit, right? But for me, decolonization is like this kind of aspirational thing, right? That it's hard for me to think concretely, right? I just don't see them giving us getting our land back, right? But I see us defending our land. I see us pointing to our land and saying, that's ours. And I see the people who are at the front lines doing that pointing as being women. And that is that is that does not surprise me in one bit, right? Because this is consistent with where we come from, our philosophical systems, our creation stories, which are still alive today. So that's, these are my sort of framing comments for decolonization, feminism, um, and my um, hesitant, cautious lack of optimism for decolonization. But I'd love to talk to you about it more, especially those who do think and, and write with it and think with it all the time. So, for me, I have to say, since there's been discussion of how we arrive at this idea or this sense of self as feminist, I have to give you two, um, not weird stories, but stories about this. So one is, myself, I'm a Mohawk from Kahnawake. I have um, a pretty typical life as a Mohawk. I grew up partially in the States. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And when I was there, I was a smart kid, sort of, cutting class, playing Frisbee, smoking dope, Stealing my dad's Marlboro Reds. So, and by dope I mean marijuana, not heroin. So, just to be clear. So, you know, I was still a smart kid and there was like this smart but failing, right? But there was this newspaper called Fireworks which was the feminist newspaper. So like some of the other s smoking girls were feminists, right? And I was like, oh, they seem pretty cool. So I'd write for that newspaper. And then I realized, like I wasn't, their issues which were 
abortion rights, like this kind of stuff. Like, I was sympathetic to that. I understood that importance, especially on the American side, right? But when I went back home to Kahnawake, it was C-31. It was the loss of our power as women. It was the encroachment of settlers on our land through time. It would seem very, very different. And that's not to say that abortion rights were probably not in some ways important to Mohawk women, but land was and is central, right? And the disempowerment of our women. So I kind of quit being a feminist, right? Like I went to university, I went back home, I left Brooklyn, I went back home, I moved back to the reserve, and I, you know, I, I, st I joined the, um, even though I have uh, what, like kind of full status, I'm not a C31, no offense against C31s, but I'm not, I'm full status, I joined the, um, like the NWAC, you know, like uh, our local in Kahnawake, because in my family we had this situation that I'm sure many people in the room have where you have, you know, an Indian guy marries a white woman, the white woman gets an Indian card, you're, and my family was my auntie married a white man, and she had to leave the reserve, right? So to me, this was an example of a serious problem. And I didn't have the language at the time to say this, but as a full status person, it, like, it's kind of like my, I have to use that privilege, because it is a privilege that I did not earn. It's a privilege I get from a colonial inequity to do something about it, right? So I stopped being the other kind of feminist, and I just started being a responsible Mohawk, I thought. So I quit saying I was a feminist, and I just was being a responsible Mohawk, and I still think I am a responsible Mohawk. But then, I, uh, and this is a weir another weird way I come back to this, is I disavowed the term feminist, I embraced just Mohawk, that's it, and I still, I still am like this somewhat, but, um, I got lured into indigenous feminism, the kind that Kim dis is not, was not interested in because of the, art, the Indian artist formerly known as Andy Smith back when she was Indian. That's a funny joke. It's still a little painful for all of us, but I was really compelled by some of her arguments and conquest, and I met her, and I was like, these are s some of those arguments were really smart. And also Kehalani Kawanui, a Kanaka Maoli feminist, and they were like, Audrey, you kind of got to join forces with us. They didn't say it like that, but they had this indigenous feminisms project and I was reluctant. And then I started talking to these women and I liked the focus on indigenous women as a center of analysis and what would happen to your questions when you centered indigenous women in this, at the center of your analysis. So they got me with this, or not, not they, but the project as it existed then, I think this was 2004, 2005, as it existed then really compelled me intellectually. And then what happened was my analysis changed, right? Like I started asking deeper questions of the relationship between dispossession, violence towards our women, and various forms of, of gender dispossession, of the loss of property rights, of the banishing of our women from territories, of its relationship to state formation, and everything started, it's like I took the other pill in the matrix, and I could see things differently. So this, so then I started somewhat embracing it. Now I still feel, I have to say, a little funny because there is, as Kim pointed out in her talk, some of this residue, like is this more the white woman's language? Is this more, am I abandoning men? I still have a tiny bit of that, but not really, because I like to think that because of this mode of analysis, I can ask deeper questions of politics, of place, of who gets privilege and what, and I can, and I'm, and, and by centering indigenous women in this, I'm doing something, and we're all doing something that hasn't been done before, and that in itself is a restoration of power, right? Power that has been taken from us along with land, along with energy, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the other way in which I came in. Now, do I think, I mean, I like very much what Kim is saying about language. When we think about language, and should we be saying this in another language, I wonder? Is, the more, is there a more precise term that can capture the, potential, the pe potentially radical possibilities of feminism in an in a indigenous language? I think that's a profound question. It's not one that I have the answers to, but it's one I definitely would like to see uh, 
definitely like to see embarked upon by people, by our students, by others here, by the language speakers, myself. I don't speak Mohawk enough to answer that question or to even contemplate it. But I, I know, for example, that these structures in our mind, these linguistic structures, they also, although we may be speaking English, they're structuring our attitudes towards each other. They're structuring our attitudes towards the state. They're, they're, uh, I think now only, still only 10% of us speak Mohawk, but that doesn't mean that we've given up on women's power, right? Or that we accept what, it is, what is said about us. I mean, we still in many ways act as if we own the place, right? And this is still very contested because of the, the Indian Act, et cetera, et cetera. This creates incredible conflict in our community. But I think the fact that we're still fighting about this is evidence that, that the linguistic con uh, conquest has not happened fully. It's not structural, right? So those are my very initial thoughts on this, and that's what pretty much all I've got for now. So if you have questions, I'm very happy to entertain them. It, do you want to each kind of say a closing remark? Oh, my. Fantastic. Start with the back first. Um, now I feel pressured to come up with something clever and <laughs> indigenous feminists. Um, I just want to say that I'm honored that all of you came and I hope that the conversations that we started are ongoing. I mean, that is the intention, right, is to have conversations because as we continue to have these conversations, you know, um, they're, they're healing and they're, they allow us vision and all that kind of thing and everybody that's here is here for that reason, right? They have something that they're thinking about or things that they can discuss. So I hope that they can keep going on and we're here too. So um, thank you once again. Uh, I'd like to echo that. Thank you so much. I, uh, in this short time with you, I've changed my thinking a bit and I appreciate that. And thank you, thank you, that's it. I've said enough, so th just thank you very much for coming out tonight. <laughs> Um, when our knowledge keeper Paula did the opening Welcome to Territory and Prayer, one of the things she said in Cree was that um, that uh, today, for, to let today be enlightening and uh, uh, allow an enlightenment. So I think that thank you for starting that way because this definitely was enlightening. So Keenan Askment now to, to all of you. Um, so we're going to close with a um, drum song. Lynn Thompson's here. She's an HIV AIDS uh, consultant and longtime activist, grassroots organizer from Pine Creek First Nation. Bougie, you guys, and it's really good to see my community out here. I am a queer person. Um, I also do live with HIV here. Um, and I just wanted to say a note on the HIV here. I know we talk about feminism, but that's not really going to happen here in this province with the rates that we are going with HIV AIDS. We have the highest rates in the world, highest rates in the country, and it's between our women between 14 and 29. So we're actually looking in the future of not having any children or children that are living with HIV AIDS. We are literally in a crisis here in our province, and that needs to change. And I hope you guys can help me change that. I've been doing this 16 years. And it's very lonely, very lot, long, hard work. And I actually really encouraged here tonight to see that because I'm, a, I'm an Aboriginal woman. I'm gay. I'm a fag. Um, I live with HIV. I uh, used to have hep C, cleared that with my traditional medicines. Um, but it's good to see I have my people here. I, have, I can go look in the back and go, oh, okay, this isn't so hard and so lonely. I have you guys behind me, and thank you so much for that. Um. I'm going to, in, in my role here as a two-spirited leader in Canada, um, I was gifted with a song um, by Pitanakut, who is my cousin in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He had gifted me with this song many, many years ago. Um, and it's a sacred song, and it's a song where I am to wake up the bear and put the bear to sleep. So I'm going to sing that. And it, I think you guys think I'm going to go, 
I, I ain't. <laughs> it's, it's a very quiet song. So if you guys can get, because I have to do it four times, I'm going to turn all directions. So if you guys can catch on to it, please sing it with me, because we're going to wake up the bears for the spring. Hi, hi. Thank you. 